And we're back with another episode of the Return of the Roar podcast. My name is Brendan Nunez. Frankie Cardicelli joining me. What's going on, Frank? Brendan, sir, happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. It is. Neither one of us are dressed. No, no. Uh, I I did wear, I was Mario this year, my, and my girlfriend was Peach, and my other roommate was, uh, well, I guess my, my roommate is my sister. They were Luigi, and I can't remember Luigi's significant other in Mario, but that's what she um, was. Uh, Princess. Not Peach and Daisy. Yes. Daisy. Yes. Exactly. So we, we were, uh, we went as like a little, a little, you know, Super Mario Party unit. Yeah, but yeah. did you not dress up this year? I didn't do anything. Um, didn't go to any Halloween party or anything. I'm waiting for the pictures, by the way, from the party that De'Aaron hosts every year. Yeah, I saw the, the Incredibles fit. You saw that, right? The Oh, no, uh, I didn't. Well, he posted it was him, Rase, and, and Little Rain. They were they were the Incredibles. They were Mr. Incredible, Mrs. Incredible, and um I think the baby's Jack or Jack Jack. Yeah, yeah. Jack name? Jack. Jack That's Jack. Right. Jack. Um, but yeah, I I heard our buddies Chris Watkins and Alan Styles having a conversation today. And I, I really hate to ask you this question because right, I know go. I know some of I know how you are with food and how you are with candy. I know the answer to part of this, but I um I do like candy corn. Okay. All right. Is that where this was going? Yeah, I mean that was part of it. I mean, also the, like the the video. If you haven't, if you are listening, haven't seen out there, the Kings posted that video of Sasha Vizenkov trying candy corn. It is honestly hilarious. It's I did not see that, dude. It's so funny. He it you have to watch it after this. It's like twenty seconds long, but it's it is hilarious. But so you like candy corn? What is your top tier candy? Like, what is your number one candy you used to look forward to getting on Halloween when you're a kid? I mean, I think like Skittles and Starburst are probably the two. Um, not, I not also good and plenty. really like, no, no. Well, nobody puts those out there. You know what mm, I mean? I, want, I wonder why. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, they're all sold out probably is really oh, yeah. what it is. Shelves are empty. Um, yeah, exactly. If I got hot tamales randomly, I'd be really hyped, okay. but that's not really happening. So yeah, Starburst, Skittles. I also really liked Milky Ways. There was like a darker Milky Way that had like some marshmallow or something. Yeah, it was like the, the dark chocolate Milky, uh, Milky Way with yeah, yeah. maybe... But yeah, exactly. I love no, caramel. So I am. Um, what about you? I, I really want. I I think they didn't hand these out, but they do now. Like we handed out candy a little bit ago. They have the white chocolate Kit Kats. Those mm. like right. If I would have gotten those when I was a kid, I would have you know lost my mind. But I think honestly, just like the OGs like Reese's and M and M's were really great. I think um, getting like Twix where it was like a really big deal. No That's one really. Good. No one really gave those out. Those were like a, maybe like I don't want to say like a pricier candy. It seems like they would be, but they seem like they're like a bougie type of chocolate, and I love it. But did you ever get anything weird? I guess that we're just on this now, but there was one house I went to one year, and they he clearly seemed unprepared, right? And closed his door for a sec, came back out with an ear of corn, like not peeled. You know, like totally unsh covered. unshucked, unshucked yeah, corn. Yeah. If that's how you say it, yes. He just gave you a he gave it to you. And, and he just gave like random different fruits and whatever to were you, were you trick or treating on the were there. Were you on a farm or something? No, no, this is just like a normal neighborhood. All his neighbors were prepared. There's no way this guy just didn't know. Um I, I have yeah. never heard of corn. I've heard of pennies. Was, yeah. Pennies. Toothbrush. Like people give out pennies. Like I remember when I was a kid, there was a house that gave out like pennies. Um floss. One person like gave out like floss, like little like the tiny little, you know, things mm -hmm. of like some dentist. Yeah, maybe. And then um no, I, I never have heard of corn. That's an that's like a one off all time experience, I'd imagine, unless anybody else out there has gotten corn before. That that guy but, did weird stuff every year for Halloween. We learned to not go to his house anymore. Yeah, like did he give out like screwdrivers one year and then like something else random the next year? Made no sense. Made no sense. That makes no sense. No, but um, you know, everyone out there have a happy Halloween. You know, just yeah. give out good candy. Don't give out corn. I agree, and hopefully the Kings have a little Halloween gift for their fans. I guess it's day after, but playing the Golden State Warriors this is going to be the second time already in the regular season. Announced. They already played two times in preseason as well and obviously the seven game series that they played in the postseason uh but before we look to that a little bit let's you know we're three games into the season now we got a win over utah for
for Sacramento, a loss to Golden State at home. And then most recently on Sunday night in overtime, pretty fun win over the Los Angeles Lakers. Um, has anything stood out to you specifically in, in these three games is like different or a big takeaway for you? I mean, I think the, the number one thing that's kind of the same is it's it's pretty not funny, but I guess you expect it. I mean, through three games, I mean, Kings have the top they're the top offense in the NBA right now. They're well, as far as points per game, they have 125.3 over three games. I think they've they've topped 130 in both of those. Of course, one took overtime, but the offense seems deep. I mean, and the roster seems very deep. And uh, I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about you know where that depth's going to come into play here when we talk about some a notable guy that might not be playing for a little bit, but. Just, just the fact that they have guys that can, and again, with Trey Lyle still sideline, they just have guys that can go out there and get the job done and no shortage of scoring options. I, I do think that the defense looks a little bit better. I mean, it's, it's a very small sample size, but they're 19th in defensive rating right now. Um, that's a that's a nice start. Obviously, they're still giving up a lot of points, but they're getting stops. It seems like when they need them more times than not, unless they're trying to slow down a guy named Steph Curry because that just is – seemingly not possible for the Kings to do. But uh, to me, my biggest takeaway is the offense. It, it, it still looks as lethal as last year. Um, De'Aaron Fox has looked incredible. Demonis Sabonis, a great start to the year. Um, and there's a couple other guys we'll probably talk about in a little bit. But what about you? Anything sticking out to you that's that's noteworthy or anything that you're worried about? Yeah, props to you for looking up the offensive defensive ratings. I have not done that yet. Um, it's been three games. Three games. It, right, it, right. It, it, it's just like it's worth kind of saying, but not really reading into. But those are, well, that's where the Kings are as of today. Right. And no, I mean, I agree with most of what you said. Like the the offense looks like it's still just totally there, right? It doesn't look like it missed a beat. In preseason, it actually looked a little sketchy at times. And, you know, as they're staggering, one of De'Aaron or Domas pretty much always on the floor. Offenses looked fine. Harrison Barnes had that huge game one, 27 in the first half, six more in the second. He ends up with 33, super efficient. And then De'Aaron, man, in these two games after that, 39 against Golden State, 37 against the Lakers, and that's not even playing a large majority of overtime, obviously with that ankle injury that we'll get to. It, it's been kind of as expected. I mean, I think the big standouts to me have been De'Aaron, like I, he's taken a lot of threes. I think he's up to 27 through three games and he's right around 37 percent he's taking a lot of threes yeah right here i mean De'Aaron's nine of 24 so nine of 24 37 percent i mean but still that's like you said i mean as far as per game that is math eight attempts per game he's letting it fly i mean yeah. he's letting it fly and it, it kind of again maybe because the king's warriors parallels and how much De'Aaron was shooting threes in the playoffs because i think steve curry even said that in that playoff series he was kind of playing a game of averages and a game of numbers and letting him shoot and kind of focusing on Kevin Herter and Keegan Murray and Harrison Barnes. And again, the Warriors did take a couple of those guys out of a series, but De'Aaron got his three point shot going in that series. And he's kind of carried it over to where, where we're seeing him right now. But if that's really who he's going to be, that's kind of been the one caveat and the one kind of downside of his game is, Oh my goodness, he's so quick and so athletic and he can get to the rim. He just can't shoot. We saw the mid range last year. That was working for him. It became a very lethal shot for him. It became an almost automatic, uh, that 15 footer, that kind of um, step back in the lane. But the three point shot looks good. And he's knocking down open looks. He's, I think, as far as contested threes, that might be something. I mean, you probably look at that at some point, maybe not right now, but I'm not sure where he is on contested threes. But it seems like the open shots have been going down. So that, that's been a welcome sight for sure. Yeah, he's definitely getting him up. I think he's been really good defensively as well, kind of setting the tone, embracing that physicality. And with that physicality that the whole team is seemingly bought into, comes a lot of fouls, right? 31 free throw attempts for Utah in game one, only 14 for the Warriors in the second game. But I don't think their defense was particularly good in that game. And then most recently against the Lakers, 34 free throw attempts for them. It was 23 in the first half, 11 in the second half in overtime. And, you know, they knew that this was going to be part of the process. When you play more physical, you're bound to have more fouls. Coach Brown has been talking about you just need to make sure to not use your hands, not be swiping at the last minute, keep them back, go vertical and things like that. So I think defensively, they definitely are embracing that physicality. I don't know how much better it's necessarily made them so far. Like they're still winning games with their offense, and I think that's fine. But we'll see. I mean, they're they're doing, I feel like, what has been asked 
so far. So we're going to have to see where they keep growing from here. But in that Lakers game, De'Aaron Fox goes down midway through the fourth quarter. He was driving to the basket, stepped on Gabe Vincent's foot with his right foot, rolled his ankle. And it sounds like he's going to be out about a week or two. It doesn't very sound optimistic, too bad. very optimistic yeah. reporting from, I mean, the big guys, like obviously, um, you know, Mark Spears, I think he was the first to put that out there that he thinks it'd be a, a week. So I don't know if that's very realistic. I mean, I don't, I think they said it, they didn't say if it was a grade one or grade two in the release. I'm pretty sure they said a moderate ankle sprain. That's yeah. what the release said. Right. Right. So, I mean, I think we can maybe assume a one or between a one and a two. I mean, I think if it was a, a two, he'd probably be out weeks or longer. Right. Yeah, it's probably somewhere in there. And to De'Aaron's credit, he definitely wants to play, obviously. Like in that game, he came back really quickly, clearly passed all their tests when he went back into the locker room, got back out there. He was definitely hobbling around. And coach said he noticed that, decided he wasn't going to play them, play him at the start of overtime, and told whoever else it was that they were going to check in. And then when he got out of the coach's huddle, noticed De'Aaron was on the floor, tried to get his attention. I'm pretty sure De'Aaron kind of just turned and looked at him, but didn't even say anything. And coach is like, well, I guess he's playing, you know? Um, and that's not a bad thing. I like didn't tweet that when coach originally said it. Cause I didn't want to use the words De'Aaron's ignored his coach because yeah, people like, could refused. take that the wrong way. Yeah. Like coach is always so big on like competitive spirit. And that's exactly what that is from De'Aaron, you know? Yeah. And I don't think it was like a, like, screw you coach. I'm staying in. It was kind of like, a, no, I'm, I'm good. Like it was like, I'm good. I want to play. I want to be out here with my guys and, and keep battling. I mean, it was, it was such a good game. And De'Aaron was such a huge part of that game, 13 in the fourth quarter. I mean, again, that also is, I guess we're going from takeaways. De'Aaron is still that guy in the fourth quarter. I think he scored double digits in two of the three games in, in the fourth. And only because Utah didn't play much down the final stretch because the Kings were up by like, you know, I think he came out in four minutes because they were up by 18 or something like that. But um, I, I think that him staying on the floor just kind of speaks to his competitiveness and how much he wants to be out there. And I mean, I think if the Kings really felt he was in a position to hurt himself more and, 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 and put himself in danger of making things a lot worse. They probably would have not even let him go back out of the, the locker room the first time. And now that the reports are out there that their injury is not serious. Maybe you give some credit to his shoes and the braces he's wearing. I mean, you have to wonder how much different it would have been if, if he's not wearing those protective braces, but um, the good news is it it's early in the year. And that's one part. The other part is it's not going to be that long of an absence. I I think at the longest it'd be maybe two, two, three weeks if it was worst case scenario. But De'Aaron Fox is a notoriously quick healer. And I think people are kind of throwing the next Friday for the in-season tournament game. Maybe. I mean, maybe that, that's got a ways away right now. I mean, that's over a week away. So uh, plenty of time for him to come back. And I think it's more exciting as far as on the other side of things that we get to see guys that we don't know as much about. Can Davion Mitchell be a guy who he was in his rookie year when he was in the starting lineup for his rookie season. Good numbers. He, he's a good, good numbers guy when he's playing high volume and playing a lot of minutes. And then again, we're going to talk about him too later on Colby Jones, who Mike Brown told you guys at practice today that Colby Jones is going to be getting a shot. And we haven't really gotten to see much of him. I think he's played one whole minute over the first three games. So bummer that De'Aaron Fox is going to be sidelined, but we know who De'Aaron Fox is. Now we get to kind of find out some other things that we are kind of wondering about. I like your target of the OKC game, which is one, two, three, four, five games from our day of recording here, which I get lost on days of the week. It is Tuesday today. So gold at Golden State on Wednesday, at Houston on Saturday, at Houston on Monday, which you know probably sucks for De'Aaron because I'm pretty sure that's the place that is closest to home for him. And yep. I believe it's the only time they go to Houston all year. And, you know, back, they play two games back. in a row with a day in between. Um, we'll see if he ends up traveling with the team or what they decide is best to do there. But after those three, you got Wednesday home against Portland, what should be another easy matchup. And then Friday, November 10th versus OKC at home, the first in season tournament game. It could be an interesting test of like, you know, I'd imagine obviously. I wonder if the fact that it's an in-season tournament game makes them like push a little harder for his availability. Obviously, like they're going to be extremely careful and precautionary, but it's almost an interesting test of like, does the in-season tournament games already hold more weight? Yeah, I mean, I'm very intrigued how to see how teams and players get up for him because again, the whole 
load management or resting thing that the NBA has been kind of going through. Some teams have kind of, I don't want to say given the finger at it, but they've said kind of, we don't give a damn about this. We're sitting guys. I think J- Joel Embiid almost sat out for that home opener there at night. And then so, I guess we were, we had a, a Kings game at night too. So apparently all of a sudden he's on the floor doing the DX thing. Just got fined. He just got fined. I think it was 8,000. So every, funny. $8,000 a thrust. <laughs> but we, we were, we were sitting in our seats. I'm like, I thought he was out, but. There have been guys, Jimmy Butler sat yep. out for rest the other night. There, there are guys you won't are, play in Minnesota, I think is the thing. <laughs> honestly, yeah. But it, how you can't do that. You can't sit out because of rest and call those guys soft. Like when you, and yeah, he did rip them that one. That's one of the funniest stories I've ever heard in my life. All timer. Because I think, did you hear Jeff Teague explain that story? Yes. The way that it, it's hilarious. Jeff Teague it, is so funny. It's it's not safe for work language. So if you want to go listen to it, guys, we can't play it here. But it is hilarious. And uh, you, you can't sit out when you say that, but may, I'm ex- I'm very interested to see how guys approach the in season tournament. Is it going to be kind of like this is a joke and whatever, or it's going to be? I don't want to say treat it like a playoff game, but treat it like an important game, like a you know, is it must win? No, but who's going to take it the most serious? I think the Kings will be probably taking it more serious than others. They'll be in that other half of they're going to be kind of taking it serious. But that's what the conversation's been. I think going into the year is. Sacramento is going to take the regular season a lot more serious than other teams do. I think that's one of the reasons why they were so good last year. They didn't, you know, load manage or rest a lot of guys. And they had the, the, you know, the luck of health, not, I don't want to say luck, but they had health on their side. So what will that mean for the play in tournament? We'll find out next week. We will. And in the meantime, not expecting deer and Fox out there, obviously, while, He takes a little bit of time to recover from this. Also worth noting that back in 2019, when he had that grade three ankle sprain, that it was his left foot. This time is the right ankle. So Mm -hmm. worth noting, um, you know, kind of a good, good positive to me. That's a good update. Yeah. I would say that if you're not re-injuring that, which I think he told us last year in a media scrum or be like, I don't know if it's ever really going to fully heal. I think just to make a lingering soreness kind of situation. So it's a good thing. He didn't aggravate that. Yeah, he came back a little early from that one is my understanding, and it's kind of just been a little lingering since there was that very interesting uh, prior to the deadline that Sabonis got brought in and Tyrese was sent out when De'Aaron was not playing games for a little while and claiming it was that you know previous injury from a couple years ago that was still kind of lingering. But anyways, he will be unavailable for a little while here. And obviously Sacramento's biggest offensive threat and like self-creator But Davion Mitchell is expected to start and coach shared today that Colby Jones will get some run, which I love. I'm super excited to see. But how do you go about replacing De'Aaron's scoring production? Do you think is there a certain player that stands out to you is like I need more from Keegan Murray or is it probably just a little bit from everybody? I think the easy answer is a little more from everybody because that's the reality of it. You're going to need a little more from everybody, but someone's going to have to take over the bulk of that. And I'm looking at two guys, really. I'm looking at, for sure, Keegan Murray, who I think has done a good job of being more aggressive. The shots haven't really been necessarily falling. I think he's gotten some really good looks. A lot of them have just been in and out. And again, even the game winner against the Lakers, that's a shot he probably knocks down, you know, more than half the time. And I think it's just a matter of he'll, can he get going? Is that taped up hand and affecting things at all? Probably not. But I think we see Keegan Was it Murray still ta- taped. Has it still he's, been taped? He's still taped. Yeah, okay. he's still taped. And my my grandpa and I was asking me that. He's like, "Is that tape on his hand bothering his shot?" I'm like, I, I I'm not sure. I don't <laughs> think so. He was taped for a lot of last year too, and he still was great. So I think those shots start falling. Mike Brown even said that he had never seen so many in and out shots as as many as Keegan had. I think against Golden State. So. Um, getting good looks and he's still up scoring at a high clip, but he needs to take more shots with Fox sideline. And then Harrison Barnes, I think he took five field goal attempts against golden state. I think we saw a little more from him against, uh, against Los Angeles, but he needs to be maybe not quite the guy in Utah. He, I don't expect 30 points a night from Harrison Barnes. He can't replicate De'Aaron shot for shot, but being more aggressive. And I think we were talking about it while watching the game against the Lakers, how, he got downhill a couple times and that is, he's so good. That's when he's at his best when he's going downhill, does his patented Euro step, which he, he loves to do so often, but he's got that big body and he's hard to slow down. And I think he's been kind of passive and disappears a little bit. And maybe that's a product of De'Aaron Fox taking a lot of shots when he's on the floor and he kind of just floats off to the side, but 
they can't really afford that right now because we I don't expect Davion Mitchell to come and take a high volume of shots, and I, I just don't know if that's realistic. But um, what about you? Do you have any, your guys your eyes on any guys that are gonna have to step up? Yeah, definitely Keegan. I think Keegan's like just under ten three point attempts per game Jeez. through these three games. He is, is shooting really? the crap out of the ball, and yeah, I want to say he's twenty. Oh my, nine. Yeah, he is. He is twenty nine uh, attempts. He is 9.7 attempts per game, and he is on 10 of 29. So 35%, um, 34%. And the coaches yelling at him to shoot more. Oh, yeah, and the field goal attempts. He's second on the Kings right now in field goal attempts per game. He's at 14.3 per game. And again, last year, I think he was averaging like nine attempts per game. So talking like a 50% increase in in aggression here. It's hard, though, because I feel like De'Aaron does so much for setting him up, right? So he, he benefits from being on the floor next to Deere. And I think more than, you know, when he's playing without Deere and the benefit of like getting more shots, I, I think that playing next to De'Aaron is better for him, but I do want him to be a little more aggressive. And so your point of HB, like, I definitely think he could be the guy. Honestly, I just don't see that on it. I always sort of have gone. I, I've learned for my own self that it's best to just not necessarily expect much from HB offensively outside of, you know, just stuff within the flow of the offense. And then when you have a big game, it's great. You know, you've joined the Chris Watkins school of thought with, with, uh, with HB. And that's fine with this roster. It was frustrating when he was the third option, you know? Yeah. Um, I think Malik, man, I think Malik is going to be the one closing games. That's what we saw in that overtime game against the Lakers. He scored 11 in that overtime period, which is just a five minute period. And also third had a and, huge assist. Third, and I believe Sacramento Kings, like Sacramento era history. I think it's Fox, really? pa- Peja, and Malik. Yeah, which was news to me the other night. So that it's, if it seems like a lot, it is. Yeah. And I, I think he's the only other guy that can really, from the perimeter, just totally break down a defense, get to the middle of the paint, and make plays from there, you know? So. He needs to really, in my mind, limit his turnovers in this next game. And I think the scoring opportunities are going to be there. So I'm looking towards Malik and Keegan. We're on the same page with Keegan. I would love to get something from HB. I just uh, don't love to bet on that necessarily. Can I throw a random? uh, Okay, so I was looking at numbers yesterday. And I'm curious if you can guess who is currently second on the team in plus minus. De'Aaron is first. It It is a wild answer. Sasha, it is fuck. It oh. is. <laughs> it's almost my bad. It almost is JaVale McGee. That you were that disgusted in it. You That's almost, why I almost said dropped it. the bomb. My fault. My fault. <laughs> it is JaVale McGee, by the way. What? It shook my mind. Uh, I think there's no way this is true, but sure enough. Uh, and his pick and roll with Malik has been good. He is very frustrating at times. You know, that tip out to LeBron was obviously like, a little much, and he has some some frustrating moments. You know I think he has one assist and three turnovers he, in these three games. He was just trying to set up LeBron for that recreation picture he from did. 20 years. He was just like, hey, let's get that Aligi out for it, which is incredible, by the way, that picture. But, I mean, I guess it's not even the rundown, but do we want to – I mean, that's – do we want to talk we about We don't have to. I just randomly okay. saw the number yesterday and thought that's it was on funny. It. It's crazy. I'll just be short and say there's been some a lot of good and a lot of bad with Javale. We can leave it at that. But um, I think the same. Do Do you expect so Davion started nine games last year, and to go through his point totals in these games, right? Nine, eight, seven, three, ten, fifteen, fifteen, eleven, and five. He doesn't exactly up his offensive production that much. You know, he he's taken a few more shots, but not that many more than average you know obviously there's a big minute increase but 8.6 when he starts 4. Point, excuse me 4.5 when he's coming off the bench and obviously like a 12 minute increase in comparison between those numbers when it comes to closing lineups and let's start with like specifically against golden state cuz i think these other games honestly the kings should just even be more talented without De'Aaron Fox to win these games against Houston twice and Portland but in this game against Golden State you know with Chris Paul, Steph Curry on the floor at the same time, assumedly to close games. What point guard do you go with from Sacramento's perspective without De'Aaron? To close games? Yeah. 
I mean, it depends. If, is Malik going to play point like he did in overtime? I mean, is that your guy to play point? Because I, to me, I feel like that's who it has to be. Yeah. It but, probably but, has but, to, right? Yeah, I mean, and it's kind of crazy with the Davion splits. Like, I'm looking at his rookie year, and this might be because there's a lot of garbage, not garbage time, but I guess that they were playing at the end of the season, and Fox, I think, believe, I believe Fox got COVID at the end of his, of Davion's rookie year, and he was starting a lot down the stretch. But Davion is a starter, 18 points a game, 7.4 assists and 19 starts. And he shot 45% from the field and 34 from three. That'd be great. Uh, but then you go one year forward and things just, they, I remember last year I was kind of expecting Davion to kind of jump into a similar, like, I guess, and I don't know why Bass Reference is not showing me, but he at nine points a game last year as a starter, just not, not the same at all. Um, and to pull up the, the full splits here, started nine games, nine points per game, four assists, um, 44 from the field, 29 from three. So again, if, if the offense that we're seeing from him, and I think he scored his first points of the year last game, he did. If that comes around, that'd be great. If, if, if he can be a two way player, not two way by definition, like, Oh my goodness, I'm expecting 20 points from Davion on him to keep playing the same on ball defense that he does. I'm not expecting that, but if he can at least be something on, on offense, then yeah, maybe there's a case for your closing lineup to include Davion and Malik, but if you're still getting one and the Kings are in golden state tomorrow and they're in the game come the end of the third quarter, I feel like you got to have Malik be your, your guy leading the offense. I think Malik has to be out there. I agree with you. And I think the question might become, is it Davion or Kevin, you know, because if you have Chris Paul and Steph Curry on the floor on the other side, last game, we saw De'Aaron guarding CP three and then Kevin Herter's on Chris Paul. And it's like, okay, well, I don't love that one. Um, you know, Kobe Jones is going to get some opportunity. Hey, man, I don't think it's insane to think that he could close the game. Could keyword, now, very keyword here. Welcome to welcome to the club. <laughs> welcome to the club. I'm I'm very intrigued. I mean, Colby was a big part of that game. Um, I mean, a lot of every preseason game, obviously, he didn't play down the stretch in that that preseason game in Golden State, but he played well. I mean, every, every time he was in the floor, that game, I believe, is when we kind of saw him a good amount off the bench in a reserve role. And he's got the basketball IQ because he was a distributor in college. He was everything in college. He was a good rebounder, a good um, distributor, summer league, same thing. Um, I'm intrigued because again, at practice today, you said he was in a, a back, a, uh, yeah, he was wearing a gray second team, uh, Penny. And it looked like pretty much he stepped into Davion's role and Davion stepped into De'Aaron's role. Unless like Malik maybe is going to bring the ball down and initiate, but I feel like, I mean, what do you think as far as Malik, just to kind of, you know, we'll go back to Colby in a second, but as far as Malik goes, is he better with the ball in his hand setting up the offense or do you like him more off ball? Because, I mean, he's proven he's not De'Aaron Fox, but they have similar skill sets as far as they can cause defenses to collapse and they can get their craft. They can get into the paint and get to the basket. Obviously, Malik's a great, you know, great shooter in stretches. I wouldn't say last year he was incredible, but he really can get hot. And when he's when he's on, he's on. Do you think he'd be better in on ball or off ball situations or do you have a preference? I think he's good at both, but I think with De'Aaron out, he's your best on ball player. So you probably just want the ball in his hands. Right. And, you know, if that means that Kobe brings it down and then gives it to Malik, like sure, whatever, or you just have Malik do it himself, which is kind of what I would expect. And then it's just like, you know, maybe I, I kind of think Kobe can play a little bit of like one, two um, play both of that a little bit. And, you know, everything runs through Domas is really what it comes down to when you're in these closing lineups. But I think Malik can do both. And he did a lot of like off ball stuff in the playoffs, I feel like, or, you know, initially De'Aaron and then it would end up getting to Malik and he'd make some plays from there. So I think he could do both, but he's easily the best on ball guy after De'Aaron. Yeah, no, for sure. And that's why I think that as good as Davion is, and maybe there is a situation where he's on the floor, I think that Malik's your guy on the floor. And then I think it's kind of a, is it Kevin? Is it Colby? Is it Chris Duarte at the two? Um, then obviously you have Sabonis out there and, and at the, you know, Keegan and HB, you just kind of got to figure out what that lineup looks like that closing lineup looks like. But, um, yeah, I, I think having Colby Jones get some reps right now. I mean, he played so well in preseason. You get to see what you have in him. Uh, we were kind of talking about, I think in the last pod about, I think my guess was he would be possibly a starter at some point, maybe not a starter, but you know, and I wish it would have happened a different way, but here we are game four and he's going to be playing maybe 15 plus minutes 
for at least the next two, three games, or maybe even a little longer if Fox, if they're careful, if the Kings are careful of bringing Fox back. But um, I do think it's a really good opportunity for him to kind of carve out a role and kind of make himself known, like, hey, I want to be part of this rotation. Uh, it, we get to see if that's going to happen sooner than later. This is very premature of me to say, but if Colby shows he can be a backup point guard, then it does make Davion a lot more expendable. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think the Davion's been fine. But I do also think this is typically the time that you would move on from a guy like that if you were unsure about re-signing him. You know, a team could get him midway through the season and have enough time with them in his system to decide, do we want to extend him? Because the extension would happen this offseason. If that uh, deal doesn't end up working out, he would end up going to restricted free agency. Um, and, you know, we don't always just mention Kevin and Davion just because or anything like also salary wise and guys that you feel like you'd be okay with finding a replacement for. Yeah. And a lot of that has to do with the other roster construction rather than those guys themselves. Um, but Kobe emerging, Kobe playing well in these games would present some very interesting, you know, coach talked about in preseason, like he's making my decisions hard, which is a good thing rotationally. And if Kobe plays well, which Honestly, I thought he looked super smooth in preseason. Coach used the description of quick but not hurried, mm -hmm. and I thought that was a great way to uh, put his game. And he's got good IQ on both ends of the floor and some versatility. So I'm interested to see what happens if he gets some reps and what that could present down the line. Um, but Kevin, one of the guys we just mentioned, had a, I guess, bounce back game. I feel a little weird saying that because I mean, it's the third game of the season. But I like think he clearly was in his head. It's been longer than that, though. If you think about, I think it was, if you add everything up, it's 16, no, 7, 7, 5, 2, 14. It's been 14 games as far as seven game playoff series, five preseason games, and then two. And that's all together. And I get that. I totally get but that. There, there is also a lot of people, though, that are like ever since the three point contest. And I haven't Ooh. looked straight up at the numbers off the top of my head, but they're not great since just saying that was very tough to watch. And uh, I think he only made like, did he make, I think he made one or two that it was really bad, really tough. It was really tough. And I was very disappointed. Chris and I were in Salt Lake City for that. And I, I had to write about it because we had to do it. We had to cover oh, no. everything. So writing about it was just like, Oh my God, like how do I write anything about this? I don't want to make it seem like it was a train wreck, but it was, but sure. I guess if you look back at that and again, his splits are bad. I think last year, as, as this, the year went on, he got worse and worse because he came out of the gates shooting like 50% from three, I think in November. I can pull it up, but it's been a while that he struggled. And I know that at three, I think he was three for seven against the Lakers. That doesn't solve all your problems, but the fact that he knocked down a shot when it mattered most, the fact that his defense was a lot better than we've seen in a long time. I mean, I think Mike Brown even kind of applauded him for, I think he had two blocks. One of his blocks came against Anthony Davis in the fourth quarter. So him he, got the chain. he got the chain. He got the chain. Him having just a positive game on both ends of the floor, which is what he did. Uh, that's what's most important. Um, last year, Kevin Herter has splits. October, we're looking at 53% over six games. November, 41% over 14 then it kind of goes down a little bit. 37, 37, 29. March, he was red hot. Red hot in March. Probably the, honestly, I forget the best month he had all year. He averaged 18 points per game on 53% shooting from the field. 51 from three. Cool. Then we get to April. Four games in April before the playoffs. 41% from the field. 25 from three. That goes into the playoffs where he shot 20% from three. So, really, at the end of last year, into the beginning of this year, not great. But if he can tap back into that, side of himself and if he can be a 38 40 percent three-point shooter that's what this offense needs and that's what they were really missing in that fir that first game against golden state just you know a couple days ago they they really needed someone to kind of step up and no one else outside of De'Aaron fox did so did, did, does that game the other night make you feel hopeful or positive that the kings can kind of tap back into kevin herter because i think we had talked about it and, and wrote about it a little bit that it was going to take more than a couple of games for Mike Brown to, to bench a guy that started every game last year. I think he started in 70% of the career games he's had or 65% of the career games he's played. He's been a starter. And I just want to know, do you feel like this is maybe the beginning of some for Kevin Herter? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I don't think I was all too concerned even leading into the game 
the weird stuff for me was like after that preseason game where Duarte started, you know, went into the locker room, thought everything was just going to be normal. And Kevin clearly, you know, had some feelings about it and super understandable. But, you know, I always feel weird speaking on a player's mental because we don't really know. But from the impressions of these press conferences, like he was he it almost seemed like like a weight was lifted off his shoulders after that last game. And you saw and the shot mentally. Yes. His reaction of a shot. And he said he could. You could see the expression on his face. He put the the thank the thank you arms yeah. up. It's it's clear he's going through it. Yeah, and so I'm sure that was good for his mental. Like for me, you know, I think defensively he can be better. And that last game he was good. He had some huge rebounds also. That was a pretty big part of that. Seven boards. Yeah, and, and some big ones. Like he went up and grabbed a one handed one near AD, and I was like, "What is going on here?" Well, um, we watch him. In, we watch him in warm ups, and he is sneaky athletic. Like it's yes. sneaky. Like we don't see it very often because again, he his job is to knock down threes. That that really is his job. He's not really supposed to go on and attack the rim, but he's sneaky athletic. We see during pregame warm ups, he kind of will bust out a dunk every once in a while. But um, yeah, I, I think that. The Kings as a whole need everyone to crash because they were not a good, believe it or not, they were not a good rebounding team last year. I know Demonis Sabonis was the best rebounder in the NBA, but the Kings overall, not a good rebounding team. And they need everybody to do a little bit more. And obviously, Keegan Murray, I think he's averaging what, like eight rebounds a game right now? It's something like that. It's something, maybe seven, but Kevin going in there and he's averaging five to begin the year over three games. I mean, again, very small sample size, but, um, if you're not going to be able to knock down threes, you got to bring something else to the table. And he's, if he can tap into that defensive side of things and crash the glass, you know, you got to provide something. And he did that last game. Yeah. I think he, I felt like he was a little bit better defensively in Atlanta than like what we've seen last year. He had okay moments. I, I think for the most part, he's a slight negative defender and a guy that definitely gets targeted by other teams. But I, I think we've seen, yeah, I mean, Kevin's an important part of this offense, right? And as long as that shot's going down, my concern that was like starting to grow a little bit in time is like, okay, defensively, I get it. You need to be better. But like your offense has to be there yeah, because that's everything that Kevin is, right? Like if shots aren't going down, then what are we really doing here, to be honest? Um, and he ha still has a threat as a shooter, even when they're not going down and he's in a slump. And a lot of the best shooters in the league go through slumps. You know, like this is still one of, I think it's 12 or 14 guys, him and Keegan were both in this group that shot above 40% on more than six per game last year. Yeah. And like two, it, I, one of six that made 200 on 40%. Like he, he was a massive part of why right. the Kings had that top offensive rating. Yeah. And the spacing, like everybody always points to like, Oh, Demonis bonus was so big for unlocking De'Aaron Fox. I think that's true. But simultaneously, you got spacing of Kevin Herter, Malik Monk, and Keegan Murray that was so big for unlocking that yeah. duo. And Kevin Herter's obviously a big part of that. And it is funny, like, so much of the conversation was around Chris Duarte. He's averaging 18 minutes. I think he's been fine, but, like, yeah. it felt like there was a lot of conversation of, like, oh, my gosh, like, how much is this guy going to play? He's been so good. 14 minutes in the first game, 26 against Golden State, 14 against the Lakers. Yeah, I mean, and again, I, I do like the defense. I can't remember what the stat was. I think he's ranking very high in a specific defensive category. I think he's first in the NBA. I can't remember what the actual defensive stat was, but um, the defense has been, I think fine, better than I expected. I think I was talking to you about it before. Like I was kind of confused why people are putting a lot of stock into him as a defender. When I think the overall reviews from him in Indiana were that he wasn't a great defender, but I think that this staff is kind of instilling like find what you're good at and, or find what you could be good at and kind of just carve out that role. I think they kind of see something in him. They see that he is able to defend because he has the uh, he has the build for it. He has a long wingspan. He's tall. He can defend the twos and threes in the NBA, but he's buying in. And when you see what he can bring to that second unit, that's why I think it's so valuable if the Kings can get Kevin Herter to tap back into what he was last year because the Kings didn't have that last year. They didn't have a guy on the bench that can defend twos and threes and knock down the three ball like Chris Duarte can. They just did not have a backup. I guess we're calling him a three. Um, yeah, he, really he was the one guarding LeBron in that Warriors yeah. game when when Harrison was out. A little different from Casey Paula and Kessler Edwards, who yes. was good at times last year, but very unpolished. Chris Duarte is a guy that has a lot, I think, more potential than both those guys, and that's no disrespect to either of them, of Kessler or KZ, who I'm not sure if KZ is Duarte can play offense is what it is. Right? Duarte can play, can play offense, yeah. And I've been I've been impressed, but... Kevin being able to be what he was against the Lakers and maybe a little more, 
that makes this team even more scary because you have Chris Duarte on the bench. Absolutely. It's nice to have a little bit of depth, like like I mentioned, just somebody else to throw at Braun, right? For it, as yes. an example, you have the same issue with a lot of guys, Paul George, Kawhi, um, Kevin Durant, like so many different guys in that's just in the division, even like Andrew Wiggins, even Keegan yeah. Murray honestly gets overpowered by Andrew Wiggins all the time. Like LeBron got Keegan too. Chest. Yeah. The, Dude, that last in layup game. in regulation, he just stood there and just stared at Keegan for probably like, I don't know, five to eight seconds and then just goes right past him for the easiest right-handed layup ever. And I can I should have looked for coach's reaction because he had to have been so pissed. It was like that. walking through an open door. I mean, Keegan didn't even try to cut him off. No resistance. Just, no, no, didn't even didn't even try to cut him off. LeBron just literally waltzed through and just went up and under for a, a score. I think that tied the game with yeah. 12 seconds left. So and then Keegan missed the shot on the other end. It looked I thought it was going in. I feel like the Kings have this kind of like curse or allergy to knocking down open game winners. I mean, I feel like the game winners we've seen have been largely contested like Harrison Barnes had a game winner against the Cavs a couple of years ago. That was crazy contested the one against the Suns. I feel like there's a pretty good contest De'Aaron in Chicago, maybe not crazy, but I thought it was not a wide open look. I think he pulled up into it, but I hate to bring up game four. There's game four HP true Keegan. Um, I'm sure there's others, but I feel like we haven't seen him just knock down a wide open. I mean, he was as wide open as you could be. That's just the hard part of it. Yeah. He was and, pretty deep, but yeah. I, don't think I think was the most ordinary. wide open one I can think of is probably Chemez. You met too. I think it was against Dallas. Oh, that was wide open. Okay. Wide that's the last, open. that's the for, last for, one. you know, understandable reason. That's the only reason why it went in. Yeah. <laughs> how's he, how's he doing in, in Phoenix? Have we checked I do him? not believe he's been playing. I can't imagine he is. We could do, I, you know, we could end this pod with like a check-in on I'm, I'm, recent Kings. I'd I'll say I'll save that. Then I'll save that. I did watch a Detroit game the other day. I was very curious how Zach Levine dropped 50 with zero assists and <laughs> lost by 15 to the Pistons. So I started watching that game. Marvin Bagley is their backup center of choice, by the way. He beat out he, James Wiseman. He beat out James Wiseman. But right now, this, that's a Jalen Duran show out there. Jalen Duran is like, he looks like a guy, man. And he's like he 19. Is. He he was so hyped in college. And I kind of was like, okay, well, Here's another overhyped big. I kind of was like, didn't want to say I got Wiseman vibes from him, but no, this this guy is 15, like in like 14 right now, or 15 and 12. He's really doing a lot of damage. So good for yeah. him. Him and Cade are quite a duo. Um, and by the way, can I just throw in like just to echo this? Uh, Keegan Murray was definitely the right pick at number three. Just yes, Jaden like, Ivy yeah. is coming off the bench, and Keegan Murray has had. I want to say he's even not looked great so far. He's looked fine, and his numbers are really good. Like, yeah, he, Keegan's averaging 16 and seven on like 34% from three, and his shots aren't even falling yet. In that game against the Lakers, he had two of the biggest offensive rebounds of the game. He got two of them in overtime. Um, he had three offensive rebounds total. I think the team had six for 20 second chance points, which the math doesn't even make sense. I think there's also team rebounds in there yeah. as well. Um, but he got two huge offensive rebounds that both led to Malik Monk threes in overtime. I think Keegan's like done a lot of the little things really well. Um, and the other guy that we got to talk to at practice day was Trey Lyles, who spoke to media for the first time since straining his calf on a, just under two weeks ago. I believe it was the, the 18th second preseason game. I think it was like the second preseason in Golden game. State. Yeah. Um, when we were in Golden State, he warmed up and then a somebody else kind of saw that he was walking slowly off the court, you know, rather than just like a typical jog. And was like, Oh, that's kind of weird. And then we got the update that he strained his ankle. He spoke or sh strained calf. his uh, left calf. Yeah, right sorry. before tip off. Like we were in our seats and like, we got the update right before, I think it was like during introductions and just said, Trey Lyle rolled out. I'm like, Oh okay. yeah. Well. Cause he was out there warming up. Um, and he shared today that pretty much he just went through his warm up and then said he was feeling a little weird. And realized he strained his calf and then he's kind of just been playing it safe since he's never had a calf injury before and you know calves can be tricky it supports a lot of the achilles which obviously is something that you really want to be able to protect and not have any risk of injuring that or added risk and in the meantime he's not been practicing he we did see him after practice today going for about 20 to i guess he continued after 
he spoke with us. So I don't know, 40, 20 to 40 minutes of working out by himself and really working up a sweat, going through shooting drills, running across the court, high knees and all this different stuff. So he looked like he's in good shape. Um, his shot is gorgeous, by the way. Yeah, I, I saw that the video you posted looked really nice. He's he's such a good shooter. Um, one and of those like, forms that's just beautiful. Well, it's crazy because, I mean, we talk about the depth. And I'm sure we might just touch on Sasha in a minute here um, before we wind down. But, I mean, the Kings have, have looked so deep this year. And they still haven't gotten their arguably, I mean, or not really an argument, I guess, their second best bench player from last year. I mean, the fact that they've been doing this. And again, two and one start, two and one start is not saying all oh, the way they're playing so well, but the offense looks good. They have a lot of weapons, and they haven't even had Trey Lyles yet, who again maybe would take some of those JaVale Gee minutes down the stretch in overtime. I'd imagine the Kings probably would have ran him at the five. I mean, is that a fair assumption? I think so, but I don't really know. They Especially love after, JaVale, man. I think they love JaVale too. I just feel like when you're in when DeMontis Sabonis fouls out, and unless you're playing against a team that has like a real bona fide, like it, it, maybe Joel Embiid or Jokic, maybe it make I could see that, but I think they could have gotten by with. I think Taylor the same. The I think the same. Well, originally they went with freaking Harrison at the five, and he was guarding AD, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I just used. I would hope they would. I'll put it that way. It was very fitting that Vladi was out there at center court for that ta- that <laughs> tap out. Chris Chris was telling me that Chris Watkins was trying yeah. to tell me that. So it's so fitting that Vladi is there for that tap out because I know it's a, a basketball play, and I think I don't think it's frowned upon as much as I think it should be. But I don't get why you don't just grab the ball because I know it you take it takes more time yeah. to corral with two hands, but slap tapping that ball. It de- I mean, you literally can lead to fast break points. just like that happened the other night, especially when you're volleyball serving it like that one was, but I digress. Yeah, no, I get you. I I'm very interested to see when Trey comes back, which he said, by the way, that he wants to participate in their next practice, which I'm assuming will be Thursday or Friday. He's hoping to, that's not so he, confirmed or he anything. He could be in play for the road trip is basically what we could take away. Could be in yes. play for maybe the first or second game in Houston or at the latest when they come home for, I mean, that's over a week away. I think he'd probably come back before than the way that he was out of breath in the, in the, you know, today's he, it was a, like a for real workout. Like he was sprinting around, um, you know, different threes and coming off uh, screens and, or like attacking closeouts and dunking. Like he looked like he was moving great. He's pushing if, it. If he didn't have the wrap or whatever that comes out of his sock up around his calf, you would have no clue that that dude was injured watching him. So he's looked good, but you know, the same way that we talked about, opportunity increased opportunity for Davion and now Kobe Jones with De'Aaron Fox out. I think Sasha Vazenkov has gotten a lot of opportunity that I would guess probably wouldn't have been there if Trey Lyles has been healthy. What have been your early impressions of reigning your league MVP? Sasha Vazenkov. He got a haircut by the way. He did. It looks great. And again, check out that candy corn video. I'm sure Kings fans have already seen it, but it is pretty funny, man. He tries, he like ranks Halloween candy and stuff like that. It's great. Um, I've been impressed. I, I think that in preseason, we kind of, I mean, I personally was a little bit worried. I thought he looked a little shaky. He looked a little uncomfortable. And from the beginning of this, I mean, these at the beginning of the first game, that season opener, I think, you know, the first three he knocked down, that first look he got in Utah, I just, that quick release is crazy. And that's a video I think you pulled that 2K Twitter got a hold of. <laughs> the 2K community was like, God, we just need this release in all. In that's green. That's all yeah, green. Yeah. <laughs> And like, yeah, it is. And I, mean, I haven't checked 2K. I haven't played 2K in this week yet, but I I'm not sure. deleted it. You deleted it? Why? I had to make space for other games. Spider-Man? No, I wish, dude. I really want to get a PlayStation just to play Spider-Man. To be oh, honest. it's only no. PlayStation? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I have. I have PlayStation, but. I have FIFA, Madden, and Red Dead downloaded. And I Red don't Dead have space for anything 2? else. Red Dead 2, yeah. I still have I not have, finished that. I want to get Red Dead 2 because I'm still waiting, Rockstar, on the announcement for GTA Same. 6, which we're hearing. Same. All these rumors about it drives me crazy. Same, actually. It's been like, I think it's been 10 years. It's been 10 years. Yeah, yeah. That was my first year in college. That's insane. <laughs> you were probably Did like- Did you play your... a lot of GTA 5? Oh my God, yes. Yes, was, same. My, okay. my roommate and I, when we, we got it the day it came out, my roommate like showed up with it on PlayStation 3, mind you, because that was what was around back wow, then. Wow, that's right. PS4 wasn't even out yet. I think it came out like, the next year. And we played that for- Every day, like we go home from school and we just would start playing. The like, kids would story be like, was so good. It was Online so too, fun. But the story was so good. But now GTA Six, like I know that's how these things go, but it's been rumored forever. 
but yeah, yes. I mean, yeah, I haven't been teased on TikTok about that for too long now. It'll come out when we're like 40 years old, I'm sure. Yeah. But I, yeah. I, um, I have not checked to see if Sasha, if, if your tweet inspired 2K <laughs> to update Sasha, but, um, it, the release looks good. He looks like he's very, he fits well in the offense. He makes smart passes. He doesn't force too much. Um, uh, I think that he's one of, or if not the best cutter without the ball, like off ball cuts, he really knows how to get to the basket and, and find a, an open spot on the floor. And that also has to do with a lot of good screening and good, you know, play designs from, from Mike Brown and his staff, but he looks like a seamless fit. I think he fits very well in the offense and still early. And even like the defense, I know it's very early, but he's looked decently engaged. I mean, he gets blown by sometimes and it looks really bad, but he's been a little better than I thought. I don't think he's like as helpless as I thought he would. And uh, he's crafty with the rebounds. He's not crazy athletic, but he finds ways to kind of poke and, um, you know, he did it when I, when I watched him with Olympiacos too, he, he wasn't skying for rebounds. I don't think you could even slide a credit card under his feet when he's jumping, but he just finds where the ball is coming down and can just kind of find a way to, you know, tip it and, and tap it to where it needs to go. But I, I wonder if he'll stay in the rotation. I think he should. I just feel like he fits well with that second group. And I think he, he plays well off Sabonis and um, they've been kind of connecting more on some, some DHOs over the last game or two, but Trey Lyles is going is to need his minutes. He, he got paid $16 million over these next two years. And, you you aren't gonna you know hold him out of the rotation. So do does Sasha lose minutes or does JaVale lose minutes? Maybe they both do. Um but I think overall it's been an impressive start. Do you do you feel the same way or are you kind of is the defense not really where you'd like it or what what do you think about Sasha so far? Yeah, well the defense hasn't been good, but it's been getting better, you know, and I think that's all you can really ask. And I think that's been the case with his entire game, right? Like even offensively in preseason you could see that that cutting and the shooting that was obviously there, but it was still just like getting a feel for the offense, understanding the flow, when to cut, when not to cut. I think him more than anybody, they've somebody's tried to pass to him and he cuts at the same time, you know. So just kind of getting on the same page with his teammates. I think offensively, he's looked a lot more comfortable these last couple of games. Um, him like that sidestep three he had coming off the screen at the top of the three, I was like, God, this guy can really, really shoot, man. Yeah. If he pulled, and, if he hit that one, he pulled into. That deep one he pulled into, we were about to lose our minds. Yes. That was, that was not, I would have been like, oh, a, the heat check, like barely into the game. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I loved it because he knocked down his first two, I think. I was like, let, he let did. Me fly. Yeah. By, oh, by yeah, the logo. That was almost yeah. logo. Yeah. As he should. As he should. Um, Be so elite. Yeah, I, I think take he's looked good. Time. Yes. And I loved Belly as well for what it's <laughs> worth. I think that he's looked good. Um, I am interested when Trey comes back whose minutes he takes. I think it's probably Sasha's. I hope that it's sometime JaVale's and you see those guys next to each other being Sasha and Trey. Cause like I said, I feel like Sasha has gotten better with each game and I'm sure the practices play a part in that. It's not like he can't get better if he's not playing in games, but I think it'd be most beneficial for him to continue growing. And so I would like to still see him as a part of the rotation, but I would understand if when Trey came back, he kind of just felt repetitive, you know, like these guys do a yeah. lot of the same stuff. Really? I think they Trey's do. better defensively. Sasha is a more, I don't even know what to say as a difference for the shooting. Cause Trey can really, really shoot. I just think Sasha is a better, like an elite shooter and Trey's a really good shooter. I think, I guess I think it'll, it'll might depend on what they need. I mean, if they're down by 10 and it's near the end of the first quarter, I mean, does that change Mike Brown's planning? I mean, maybe they go to Trey obviously for defense. Maybe if they're, you know, they have a lead. They're trying to kind of push it. Maybe they put Sasha in to kind of put the nail in the coffin. I don't know, but it could be kind of a, what they need in that situation. But I feel like more times than not, we're going to see Trey Lyles as the backup for, I mean, that's just, that's his spot. I think you said the other day too, like in the NBA, you don't just lose your spot, you know, being hurt. You don't in more times than not, you don't just lose your spot. Like you, that's yours. You earn that. And until you have a reason that you don't, you know, until you have not earned it and you're falling off, Again, which was the conversation with Kevin Herter is at what point do you make that move? And clearly it's not now. It's not time for Trey Lyles to be moved out of the lineup either. He he was so good for them last year. He had a really good showing in at least a couple playoff games. And it, it does make me a little upset, but I think Sasha might see his minutes dip a little bit. Yes, we will see what ends up happening. Um, do you want to close with alternating, looking up some X-Kings and how they've been yes. starting? I'll take okay. Bagley because I have not looked at what he's been doing. Okay, I'll let you start with Bagley. I'll pull up Messi in the meantime. Okay. Okay, well, Marvin Bagley. 
you know, I'll, I'll give him a little credit. Been four games, and I think he was not great last year. I think statistically last year might have been his worst year, like full season as a professional. Um, 12 points a game, six rebounds. But this year, four games off the bench playing 17 minutes, which is a career low, by the way. 11.5 points, 5.5 rebounds on a career high, 66% shooting. So, I mean, it looks like he's doing okay. I mean, he, yeah. he playing behind Jalen Duran. He's bad. a five fully now, it seems. Um, uh, watching okay. him and Jaden yeah. Ivey play together is like a very weird alternate reality that I am glad to not be living in. I'm very glad. No, I'm very, very glad I'm not living in it. I mean, I, I do think that Jaden Ivey was an intriguing pick at the time, but looking back now, I can't believe I even thought that Keegan Murray would even not even cons- I was not fully in on Keegan Murray when it happened. And I want to kick myself for it because he's just a perfect fit for this offense. But who else is out there that we need to check on? So I got Chemezi Metu right here. Um, okay. Has not played for Phoenix except for two and a half minutes of garbage time in their 22 point win over the Utah Jazz that was a couple days ago. So they've got a little bit of wow. like. Yuta Watanabe is playing over him, and so is um, – there's one other that I'm forgetting. Another wing um, that I can't remember off the top of my head. On Phoenix? On Phoenix? Yeah, that I don't even think is great. Like, Josh Okogie starting for them, and I think Eric that's Gordon, Eric up. Gordon. Um, Eric Gordon is, I think, uh, also a part of that starting lineup, at least while they've been injured. Yeah. I got their guys here. Nasir Little and Yuta Watanabe are uh, both playing over Chemezi Metu. Because the Portland worth. trade. Yes. Um, speaking of former Kings bigs, Rashawn Holmes mm. has not put, has not played a game for Dallas yet. I think he's actually out of the rotation. I'm, I took a look the other it day and I liked it. I think he's out of the rotation. Um, Casey Akpala is not on a team. Derek and Lively was, has been good by the way for Dallas, which probably is Duke, part of that he, Duke guy. He's been, he's been pretty good. Is he, he's Duke yeah. guy, isn't, no, Lively's not a Duke guy. Is he? he yeah. He, he, I'm pretty sure he is. I think he is. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a Duke guy. I remember him from Duke. But I, I do think Namias Keda, we might see mm. him crack the rotation at some point with Boston because apparently he was very impressive in preseason. And a lot of guys I was seeing, I mean, you, you're you a Celtics guy. Were you seeing the same thing? I, I mean, people were impressed by him. Yeah, I definitely had Celtics buddies I know asking me about him and, you know, just kind of had to be like, well, every once in a while he has a quarter where you're like, whoa. And then outside of that, he leaves a decent bit to be desired. But he's young. And he's a big. And I think a lot of bigs, honestly, when they're a little bit more projects like that, and Nimi definitely had to grow into his body, get used to that. A lot of bigs, like, you're probably not going to work with your first team when you're a second round big. Like, you're going to take time to develop. And more often than not, one team is not going to give you all that time. But then when you move to a new place, your sort of leash and amount of time they're willing to give you extends. And I think that's really good for Nimi. So we'll see. Yeah, I got totally uh, Delhi stats here. Ooh, playing for from Melbourne. Really? How's he doing? Eight games. He started in six of them. He's averaging just under 23 minutes, 14 points, oh. 38% from the field, and 32% 14... from three. Wait, 14 points over 23 minutes? Yeah, on That's... 38% from the field. He's shooting it almost 12 times a game. He's had a fly. And but his per 36 had to be off the charts. Four assists, four and a half rebounds, where steals here, 0. 0.75. Um, I'm going to quickly try to look at who's on his team. I wonder if there's anybody that we would know. Maybe. I wonder how PJ Dozier's doing, actually. I'll think about it because he was playing. That's a good one. Oh, okay. Ian Clark is on the same team. Wow. As Matthew Della Vadova. <laughs> Ian Clark. <laughs> And that's the only name I recognize here. How long has he been out of the league? He's been out of the league for a minute. Yeah, it's been a little while. He was 2013 draft. Gosh. PJ Dozier in Mm -hmm. five games is averaging nine points per game, two assists, two rebounds, 56% from the field, 27 from three. He's in the EuroLeague right now. And I remember seeing him. uh, They like, he's in the, I mean, EuroLeague is where they have like the, they like light the, there's fire torches around the. Yes around the stadium and they're like lighting off fireworks in the middle of, of the game, which is insanity. Does but, it say what his team is? Yeah. Um, he plays for partisan. Sure. Okay. 
Partisan Mozart bet. Sure. Um, anyone else on that team? Frank Kaminsky's on that team. Mm. Frank the Tank. And Frank the Tank's averaging 15 points per game. He leads our team in scoring. Uh, 76% shooting from the field and 62% from three. It's been four games. I think he's had a really good start to the year. But that's that's, that's Frank. And then uh, you said Kaminsky, right? Not Neil Aquina. No. Wait, is that, was that, yeah, I'm pretty sure that was Kaminsky. I just saw, right? Okay. Yeah, it's, that's okay. Frank Kaminsky. Frank the Tank Kaminsky. Um, gotcha. And then how about, is Chima playing? I, right I have Chima here. Uh, okay. Gasconia. He's been playing in the, let's see, ACB is the Spanish League and also in the Euro League. They've played 11 games total. He started in one, playing 23 minutes a night, 13 and a half points on 57% from the field. And just under two threes a game, 47% so far. Again, just 11 games. Also got 5.3 rebounds, or I'm sorry, 7.6 rebounds, two assists. Let's see if there's anybody else on this roster playing with Chima, out of curiosity. Marcus Howard. Oh, yeah. And I think that's all I got. A Khalifa Diop. Does that sound familiar? It doesn't sound familiar. 2022 draft, second round, I guess. Doesn't and then Casey at Paula is oh, not Nico on. Mannion. Nico Man, oh, is he? He left. He's on this he, team. Was he a one and done? He played his rookie year and he took off. I believe so. Yeah. So Chima Moneki, Nico Mannion, and Marcus Howard. Best and then uh, Casey at Paula is not on a team right now. Mm. So waiting on that. And then just a bonus one, Dante DiVincenzo. I just wanted to kind of throw him in there because oh, yes. right here, three games with with the New York Knicks, seven points, three rebounds. Yikes, 38% from the field, 30% from three. And last year, he was actually pretty good with the Warriors. He was 40, almost 40% from three last year and 1.3 steals. But, you know, he got, got a nice contract with New York and not really doing much at the moment. But it's been very, very, um, well, it's very, very early. So It is. And Terrence Davis is still not on a team. I know there were rumors about him going to Olympiacos, which would be very funny. And trade. I would have very trade. much been rooting for him to win your league MVP because that would have been the funniest timeline. But I don't see him anywhere right now, which is interesting. No, I think he's still out there. But um, yeah, that would have been kind of funny. Sasha for TD trade. Yeah. I probably yeah. would have made I probably, I'd make that trade. Sure. Sure. Any other final thoughts before we get out of here, Frank? That was pretty fun, actually. No, it was great. Uh, I think we could do that. I'm down to do that at the end of every episode, honestly. I think Chris, when it, whenever Chris is on, I think you'd like that too. We do this thing we used to where it was like a basketball up and roulette where we just like look up the guys that are on the the main page on like basketball. Reference. Like right now it's... Uh, oh God, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like right now there's Anton Jameson, like Reggie Miller, Clyde Drexler. There's, there's random people sometimes though. Um, but I think random Kings, like not random, but past Kings kind of checking on how they're doing. But uh, upcoming stretch for Sacramento, like you said, Kings Warriors for the millionth time tomorrow. I don't really expect a win on that one, but then you get a couple quote unquote easy games. You get two in Houston, then you come back home for uh, Portland. I, I just will, I'll throw it out there. I think anything less than three wins would be disappointing. I do too. Can, can we say that? Yeah, I think we absolutely can. But you got to beat both. You got to beat Houston, and you got to beat Portland. Like who is? pretty much i don't want to say tanking again but they're they're not going to be in the mix for the playoffs so and if you lose one of them then like beat golden state the sun is slowly getting worse i know anybody on the youtube side two and two two and two is the worst but three and one i think i'll be you know anything less i'll be disappointed but yeah should be should be fun to watch uh them play some teams that are you know not the warriors because I, I really can't remember the last time i was at a, a game at golden one center where it wasn't the warriors or the lakers so that'll be fun this Warriors game is really big, honestly. Um, you think so? As big as it gets for like a fourth game in the season, you know what I mean? Like, there's a chance that you're really competing with this team for seeding, and the head-to-head -head matchup is always the tiebreaker. Like, mm -hmm. going down 0-2 in the season matchup, I don't, like, that would suck pretty early on, you know? Um, so again, only as big as it can get for the fourth game of the season. I'm not saying this is a huge game, but no, I get I what you mean winning. Yeah. Like having that tiebreaker is huge, especially like, look at how close the West was last year. Right. When it came to total wins. Yeah. No, I totally get what you mean. And it is a huge bummer when you look at it that way, because Fox is not going to be available, right. but crazier things have happened. And, uh, I think the Kings in the regular season have not, have not beaten golden state at chase center. And like, since the year it opened. So that's a, that's a bummer. Really? But, yeah. I think the game six win was the first time they'd beaten them at chase in three years since it opened. 
So wow. they're due again for a regular season win. But uh, yeah, if, if you can't beat the Warriors, that puts a lot more pressure on them in the second half. Or I guess they play them again later this month in San Francisco. So that will make that, that game a lot more important. That's a playing game or a in-season tournament game too. So almost through that part of the, the Warriors part of the schedule. We almost through it. Almost. And our buddy Jason Anderson tweeted that the Warriors have listed Clay Thompson at, and Dar- Dario Sarge as probable. And Jonathan Kaminga is listed as questionable. Mm. Draymond Green is back, by the way. Draymond's I wish he was back. playing in Golden 1 to see what that reaction would be like. At one point, they put him on the big screen, the Jumbotron, and everybody started booing. And he looked up and noticed it and gave a little smile at a peace <laughs> sign. I thought it was a funny moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, they always you know, really compete when they go at each other. Both these teams know each other extremely well. So I'm excited for that matchup and agree with you. Need three and one over these next four. And let's see what this in-season tournament looks like because yeah. the court the court does not look good, but maybe no. the games will be. Did you see the video of KD going like, what? Like, it's yes. work? Like, yeah. like, and then he like pretends that it's good and it's like, okay. Like, oh man, I can play on an like, orange court. It's like, yeah, man. Kings are it's... playing like, looks like the Kings are playing like on Brooklyn's court. That's what it looks like. That's all I could think of too. That's the only court I've seen, right? And I think yeah. that um, it's good for the them. NBA teams does it too, I think. But yeah, no, good for them. It looks like it looks cool there, but that's not really that doesn't really do anything for the Kings. No. So no, it doesn't. And they, the NBA wanted to be red. They, why? Why do they keep doing that? It's not why, good. No, red it's, is it's god horrible. Though. Red is not a dominant color for the Kings. I don't think it has been for a very long time. It looks horrible. Those red Sacktown jerseys from a couple of years ago. Or the they're again they're worse than the gold in my opinion. They're worse. I than agree. The gold. I absolutely agree. But absolutely agree. Anyways, man, I'll see you tomorrow. We're gonna be on uh on our way to the Bay Area. Make sure you guys check out our work. We'll be, you know, enjoying that ice cream that the Warriors press room has because I'm gonna be getting in on that. Absolutely. Same here. Vanilla ice cream on the way. Definitely adding some sprinkles. Not afraid to admit it. Yep. And all of our work will be up on SacktownSports.com. Got a uh, handful of things up there every day and definitely going to be some coverage on these upcoming games from myself, Frankie, and a couple other people that write for the site as well. Check out Emil's content for 49er coverage. Just traded for Chase Young on the deadline. Mm -hmm. Pretty big deal. But that's going to do it for this episode of the Return of the Roar podcast. Definitely Feel free to subscribe and like on different listening platforms if you want to stay tuned for more upcoming episodes, one to two a week for us throughout the course of the season here. And again, check out SackdownSports.com for for more content. So appreciate everybody listening, and you'll hear from us again in a couple days. Happy Halloween.